Welcome to Time for Hope, a faith-based mental health program. Join our host, certified clinical mental health counselor and Christian psychotherapist, Dr. Frida Cruz, and her guests as they discuss real-life issues and offer expert clinical advice and solid biblical application for any and all life situations. Now, here's the host of Time for Hope, Dr. Frida Cruz. Thank you for joining me on another edition of Time for Hope. I appreciate each and every one of you, and I pray that God will use what my guest and I are about to share with you to inform and empower you to make positive changes in your life. My guest for today is author, pastor, and director of counseling at Chelton Baptist Church in Dresher, Pennsylvania, Dr. William P. Smith. Bill has come to share with us from his book titled, Loving Well, Even If You Haven't Been. If you seem to keep repeating the same relationship mistakes, stay with us as Bill and I share how you can stop these destructive patterns from controlling your relationships and instead learn to love others as a result of experiencing God's love for yourself. And William, and I'm going to be calling you Bill, Dr. Uh, Smith, it's great having you on Time for Hope. Thank you for having me. And your name is so common. Everywhere I turn, there's a William, it seems like, in my life. My dad was a William. My son, of course, is a junior, and we call him Bill. Do you go by Bill generally? I go by Bill, yeah. Y yes, and uh, so do you know the background of where this William comes from? From the kings, right? From the kings, absolutely. They used to name their sons after the kings. And of course, my dad came from Ireland. And uh, so uh, I think he had a double. His was William Henry. Okay. Uh, yes. But anyway, you've I've uh, gone through your book. You've done a great job. And you are meeting a need. I encourage our viewers from the very start mm. Uh, to get a copy of your book and realize that we as professing Christians are failing in this very area, failing to love one another, uh, failing to care for one another, failing to be there for one another. Not everybody. There are some that uh, work overtime at it, and we yeah. praise the Lord yes. for them. But our churches as a whole need to get the truth that you have in your book, mm. that God intends us to love one another. He says it over and over and over in the scriptures as you bring out. So let's start with a question. What do you mean by the empty ways of life? That's actually a phrase that comes out of 1 Peter. He describes it as Jesus has rescued you from the empty ways of life handed down to you by your forefathers. And you recognize that you and I have both had experiences from our past, from the people that were supposed to care for us and nurture us, that were not exactly the way that God would have cared for us and loved us. And that now has translated into our own worlds as the way that we naturally fall back on when we're trying to engage other people even when we know it's not going to be very helpful. You know, Bill, we're doing a good job, I believe, these days. I know uh, Franklin Graham does an extraordinary uh, job of looking after the hungry and uh, the needy and going uh, to these places, uh, you know, it, across the nations. Uh, he, he's, he's doing a wonderful job and a wonderful work. I, I know Franklin, and he's just a, a super guy doing a wonderful ministry as well as carrying on his, uh, his father's ministry. And then we have churches in Spartanburg that are meeting the, the needs of pe the phys physiological needs of people like food and clothing and they're doing a great job at it and we want to give them credit for that. But there are people that have plenty of clothes, plenty of food, nice homes to live yes. in that are not being cared for and looked after and loved as God would have the church doing. Do you agree with me on Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Uh, I think every single one of us struggles in that area because every single one of us runs into people daily who are not always very easy to care for. We know there's at least two realities to every person we meet today. We know that they've suffered and we know that they've sinned. 
which means that if I want to have a relationship with anybody, I've got to get good at learning how to engage sufferers and sinners apart from their physical needs. And, and the physical needs are huge, but there's that relational dynamic where I am called as an ambassador of Jesus Christ out of 2 Corinthians 5 to give you an experience of what it's like to be in God's presence, to care for you the way that He would. Because he says so plainly that he ministers to us in our need. God does. He ministers to us. And I found that to be true personally. But he says at the same time, you are to learn from this how I minister to you. And you're to go out and minister to others that are in pain and hurt, hurting and, and suffering in the same way that I've ministered to to you. And that's where I think the hope comes, because if I can only give away what I've experienced, and if all I've experienced are these empty ways of life from my forefathers, I'm really stuck knowing how to care for you, except that Jesus breaks into that circle, that closed loop, and he gives me a present active experience of what it's like to be loved. And I look through the scriptures, and he never commands me to love someone in a way that I've not already experienced from him. So I'm only told to forgive someone after I've been forgiven. And I'm only told to pursue someone after I've been pursued. And I'm only told to comfort someone after I've been comforted. And I start to realize in the scripture, he's always the one who's doing the active initiating of love. And then he invites me to give away a little tiny bit of that experience to somebody else. You broke it down uh, in, I believe, three sections uh, of learning to love as as your book uh, brings out and I liked that a lot and so we start out with what we're talking about comforting love how do you comfort others um, and then you've got sympathetic love where you can sympathize uh, with them as a counselor you empathize right. uh, very often uh, struggling love um, that's confessing our temptations to one another. How in the world often do we do that? Are we going to, do we have anyone that we can sit down with and say, you know what? I need you to pray with me. I'm going through a terrible time. I'm being tempted in such and such a way. And yet when we do that, it opens up the relationship. My wife and I were away from the kids for a couple days and we came back and I'm, we're around the table and I said, so where did we see Jesus in the last several days? And my daughter turns the question back around to me, where did you, Daddy? And I said, I saw him as I was tempted to be deceitful and unpacked a story where uh, I had broken something in a friend's house and tried to cover it up. And the Lord convicted me of that in that moment. And you just start to watch my son start to engage a little bit more in the rest of the family. And I actually think I learned that from Jesus because he shares stories that you could not know otherwise about the ways that he was tempted while he was on earth. You remember that time when he's in the desert and Satan comes yeah. back and forth. There isn't anybody else around during that time. Therefore, the only way that you and I know the details of that story is if he decided to share them with us. And so our God unpacks himself at that level. Here's the things that I struggle with or where the places where I could have tempted where I was tempted, could have fallen, didn't, and now he invites us to have that same experience with each other. You know, there's a great debate over that, whether he could have given in, and I believe he could have given in. I've read where his temptations actually are more painful yes. than ours because uh, he didn't give in. Never, never, never did he give in to a temptation. And some say, well, it makes it worse because he couldn't give in. And, uh, but he was tempted no matter what, whichever direction you take, he was tempted as we are. The scriptures are very clear about that. Hebrews chapter four, tempted in every way, Mm -hmm. which means that if it was in every way that you and I are tempted, failure mm -hmm. was a possibility. Otherwise, it's not in every way, mm -hmm. yet did not sin. He was human. He, yes. That's what people do not understand, that Jesus was as human as he was God, and he was as much God as he was human. That's, that is difficult to grasp, oh, isn't I think it? Nearly impossible. We're, we're still struggling just to be, begin to understand what he's already revealed. But as Hebrews continues to say uh, in chapter 4, 
it's that experience that allows him to give grace to us in our time of need, which gives me grace at the table when I'm tempted not to share my failings with my kids, but I've realized that, no, God gives me the grace to share in the same way that he shared himself with me. And I watch the same thing happen. I watch us get drawn together in the same way that he draws me together with him. You know, I have a dear, dear friend, um, and he's been on my show talking about it, and we've been friends for a very long time, and he's, he's passing through his seventh time of tongue and throat cancer. Oh. And I uh, still a professor at John Brown University. But you know who I know understands me and whom I mm -hmm. can call and, and talk with when I'm going through a difficult time or a, a particular temptation. I can call him. Because you know he gets it. I know he gets it and that he, that he care. also know he cares. Yes. He lets me know every so often I get an email reminding me he's, still, he's praying for me. Mm. and that he cares. Uh, and uh, so it's, one, you know, I, I, would, I would love to have a lot of friends like him, but he is a true friend and, and really fits into what you've written about in your book. And as you were saying earlier, that is what the church is supposed to be. It's a community of struggling saints who get each other and who are able to share, here's the comfort that I've received, 2 Corinthians 1, here's the comfort that I've received from God in my time of struggle that is not just for me, but it's also for you. You know, my understanding of the early church is that there wasn't a preacher that stood up and just preached and everybody mm. else kept quiet. Mm. Uh, if I, when I'm reading the scriptures, I find that they were weeping with those that weep, they were rejoicing with those that re were rejoicing, and so forth. They were sharing with each other when, in, in their church services. Uh, do you gather that? I, th I think in church services, so a little more formalized, and in their normal daily lives. Mm -hmm. And you realize that this is what we're here for. Mm -hmm. We can be successful, we can have our jobs, we can have our family, but we're here for more than that. We're I, here to rebuild the, the community that God started in Eden that His grace is now allowing us to recapture. We can even gather that with Jesus being at Mary and Martha and Lazarus' home, yes. can't we? Yes. That uh, they, they were sharing. Uh, Jesus was sharing and relax. He was able to relax with them. Uh, he knew they loved him, mm -hmm. but at the same time, Mary uh, was ministering to him. So was Martha in her way, uh, ministering to him and taking care of his needs. And they were, as it were, flowing in uh, to each other's lives. And I wonder if some of this is some of our westernized form of thinking, that, that the, the good emphasis on the individual may be overblown, and so we forget the community you realize that when God calls us to image Him, it's not simply as individuals, but as a community, because He's a community. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, constantly engaged, constantly interacting, and He creates humanity in His image. The word there in Genesis is not just individual man or, or woman, but humanity in totality. And so relationships are at the core of who we are, and they're at the core of who we're redeemed to be. Yeah, you know, every pain we feel comes from relationship. Every mm -hmm. joy mm -hmm. and peace uh, comes from relationship, either from our vertical relationship yes. with yes. the Lord or our horizontal relationships with other people. You agree with me? I do. But it's I do. time for a break, and we'll be right back. Psychologist Dr. James Dobson relates that lack of self-esteem produces more symptoms of psychiatric disorders than any other factor yet identified. Self-esteem is a conscious or unconscious self-evaluation related to our worth as persons. We can relate more easily when we use the word feel. How do I feel about myself? Do I feel that I measure up to other people? Would my feelings include the word shame when it comes to me, my relationships, my behavior, or my family? 
Shame comes from having been abused as a child or adult, having an alcoholic father or mother, indulging in self-depreciating behaviors, having been convinced by others that we are unattractive or, in other ways, don't measure up. A low self-image can often be linked to our early home environments. The face of a female client comes to my mind who was experiencing a deep clinical depression and a very low opinion of herself, and the two generally go hand in glove. As we talked about her familial history and background, she recalled that her father repeatedly told her while she was growing up that she was the ugliest girl he had ever seen. Gradually, we were able to restructure her thinking about herself by identifying her positives as a woman, wife, mother, and Christian. Making friends with ourselves by coming to appreciate who we really are and realizing our potential to become a shame-free, confident child of the Creator God breeds healthy self-esteem. Armed with the inner knowledge that we are prized by God, we stand on equal footing with those around us. So what should be our plan of action for loving others, gaining and enjoying a strong sense of ourselves, our abilities, and our value as persons? Resolve to put the past in the past. Willingly forgive those who have hurt you. Seek the forgiveness of those whom you have hurt. Ask God to forgive you for all offenses against Him and resolve to allow personal abuse, losses, betrayals, and failures to transform you into the person you were meant to be. Let yourself love others the way you want to without letting previous abuse get in the way. Instead of allowing your past or present to hold you captive, resolve to find the freedom available in Jesus Christ. In Him, you are free to be free from all that keeps you from being the person that you were meant to be. Thanks for staying with us on Time for Hope. Our guest for today is Dr. William Smith, and we're talking about his book, Loving Well, even if you haven't been. So uh, it can be a new start. It can be something we never, you know, some of, some people that will be viewing this show, Bill, have never given this a thought. Mm. Uh, it will be new thinking for them uh, that we're talking about. And, uh, and then some people, there are those that don't need relationships as much as others need relationships. But I know, I don't know of anyone anyone that doesn't uh, need uh, to be in relationship with other people. You are a therapist, and I, I saw the latest stats on this recently, and it was true many years ago, that loneliness lies at the root of much mental illness. I think you're absolutely right, and I think that that's part of why Jesus recalls us back together. You think about a passage like Ephesians chapter 2, where the first part talks about how God has saved you as an individual. The second half is all about how God has saved you into a community. You're not supposed to be lonely. And yes, some of us need a whole lot less interaction than others. I would tend to be out on that introvert end of the scale, but we're still required by, who, by virtue of who God's made us to be engaged with each other. And I would even push some of us who prefer to be alone a little bit more. Maybe it's not always for me, but it's for the sake of the other people that I need to be engaged. Then also in relationship, though, we're not to be self-centered and, and doing it so, for what we get out of it. it. We're to be givers, not takers. 
and it's very easy for us to sort of put on the mask of a giver so that it feeds me a little bit mm -hmm. more. Uh, I know one young lady who had to be, uh, had one of her friends pull her up short a little bit in college and say, you understand that when you give, we all know that that's to make you feel good. And so we really would rather you didn't give to us anymore. It was very helpful for me. I, I almost embarrassed to have to admit it, but it was a good 10 years into my marriage before I started to realize that I'm not there to finally get my wife to get on board with whatever makes my world easiest. I'm actually there to at, learn to ask a question, what do you need today from me, from me to be the person that God meant you to be? Mm -hmm. Not the person I'd prefer you to be, not even the person maybe you'd mm -hmm. prefer to be, but who God made you to be. You know, Bill, uh, and I've done some shows on that, and it's a great need for men. It is a great need, especially for men, uh, to realize that their wives need things from them that many of them never ask for, or if they ask, they're, 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 they're not understood. Or they or, might not even uh, know themselves. Or they m might not even know themselves, and uh, or they're nagging. You know, <laughs> men use that word uh, a lot, they're being nagged. I think we like to use that word because it sort of makes the lady feel really bad about herself mm -hmm. and gets us off the hook from actually having to lay our lives down for our wives, which is our calling out of Ephesians 5. Very clear and plain. I have often said, and I don't know if you would agree with me on this. I had someone disagree with me on this. Uh, wives submit, which is a voluntary subjection, yourselves to your husbands, okay? Uh, and I have said that if the husbands would do the rest of that chapter, like they're advised to, it wouldn't be difficult for wives uh, to be that voluntarily subject themselves to their husband's I leadership. Think it, would, it would be an awful lot easier. And actually, all of those chapters 5 and 6 all flow out of that one place uh, back in chapter, oh, I'm going to forget now. Is it chapter 4 where we're told to, 418, to be filled with the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. part of which is to submit to one another. Yes. And I think chapters 5 and 6 flow out of submitting to one another. Ladies, here's what it looks like for you. Men, here's what it looks like for you. Children, here's what it looks like for you. Parents, here's what it looks like mm -hmm. for you. Employees, masters, all of that is an exegesis of submitting to one another. Yeah. It has to do with humility. Who in the yes. world do we think we are? We're not much without God's love and without uh, the Holy Spirit uh, growing us up in Jesus Christ, are we? No, and our, our calling is to be here in the same way that Jesus was here for the sake of the other people. You can't get any more clear from Ephesians chapter two where he leaves everything at the highest point to come down to be the lowest servant for what? To benefit the rest of us. Yeah. Why would we think that our calling is any different than that? Yeah, and I'm I'm learning um, because I, when I go out into the public, I'm recognized as being on TV, and um, that I am approached and so forth. And I am learning that uh, to uh, let people know they're important people. Mm. I'm not the only one important in this because I'm on TV. You're important. So I ask their name and where they attend church and are, are, get, are getting involved a little bit in their lives. And sometimes right there on the spot, they're in such distress, I pray with them right mm -hmm. out in public, mm -hmm. right on the spot. Mm -hmm. And um, But being able to say, I love you, uh, means a whole lot. I've even found in counseling, there are some people that have never been told that. Yes, they've not been told that from uh, their families growing up, from their friends, from their neighbors, from their current families, and when the church doesn't do a good job of that either. But what you're, th what you're talking about actually sounds to me like one of the chapters in the book on greeting each other, recognizing that's what God does. He comes to Abraham, he comes to Hagar, he comes to these complete nobodies, and he calls them by name, introduces himself mm -hmm. to care about them. And you're saying that as you do that with other people, it makes a huge difference in their lives. Well, they're, they're uh, special to me, and I, I let them know that. Mm. And uh, so, uh, and I think it, 
if our churches could realize that everybody, and you say it uh, in your book, uh, everybody needs to know they're special uh, to other people and need, need to know they're loved and uh, so forth. So I totally agree with you, uh, loving well, even if you haven't been. And I would encourage our viewers, number one, again, to get your book, and number two, to start learning to love. Mm -hmm. I like that, learning to love. Uh, let me tell you how much I appreciate you coming all the way from Pennsylvania. I have a grandson lives up there uh, in that area. To, to appear on Time for Hope and to share your book with us. Then I have something to share with you from a viewer. Dear Dr. Frieda, my husband recently passed away and, and I just found out that he has been unfaithful to me for the past five years with my sister. I am trying to forgive them and get it out of my mind. Please pray that I will be able to forgive and move on with my life. Be assured that we have covered this prayer request uh, with our Heavenly Father and that He is able to bring every bit of this about in your life. If you haven't shared your prayer request with us, we encourage you to do so because we pray over each and every one that comes in to Time for Hope. And then I have a word of encouragement. Dear Dr. Frieda, I viewed your TV show, Time for Hope, for the first time this morning. I tremendously enjoyed the program and we'll be viewing again. Thank you so much and thank you for your encouraging note. And I, I invite others uh, to let us know when you're viewing our program and that you're being blessed by it because it all comes from our Heavenly Father through the Holy Spirit of God and through, uh, through His Word. I can't take any credit for it. Uh, just give all the glory to the Lord and look forward to having you join us again next week on Time for Hope. A free fact sheet that contains additional information about today's topic is available upon request from our ministry. You can also receive a copy of today's resource for a contribution of any amount to the Time for Hope ministry. Call us at 800-669-9133. Write us at Post Office Box 2169, Spartanburg, South Carolina, 29304. Or visit our website at timeforhope.org. When you call or write, prayerfully consider a donation to our ministry. Our ministry's mission is to offer hope to discouraged and hurting people. As we continue to give out messages of hope, a financial gift of any amount to support this ministry will be greatly appreciated. When you do this, you are joining us in offering hope to many viewers seeking help and hope for their situation. This will also enable us to inform and inspire some viewers to expand our mission as they learn and in turn can minister more effectively to hurting people around them. Until next time, have a great week. And remember, it is time for hope.